Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to Guarding Our Money, Women in Compensation. My name is Roberta Burroughs, and I am a board member of the NASDAQ Entrepreneurial Center and a strong advocate for entrepreneurship. So I'm serving as your moderator today. Let's get started. Um, overall, you know, the gender pay gap and pay equity, equal pay for equal work is something I know many of you are living through today. So in this session, we'll be discussing how you, as mighty business owners, can build pay practices and principles into your company to drive greater success, not only for yourselves, but for your company, your future employees, and the community at large. But before we get started, I want to give a little brief synopsis and share a little bit of context on how we came to bring this discussion together for everyone today. So the NASDAQ Entrepreneurial Center, which is a nonprofit committed to access and opportunity for all entrepreneurs, teamed up with another nonprofit, Fair Pay Workplace. And Fair Pay Workplace is responsible for dismantling pay inequities in the workplace based on gender and race. Working with the Penn State research team earlier this year, we put together a grant that seeks to help women business owners have agency, confidence, and knowledge to make the best possible decisions around pay for themselves and their companies. Because we believe it's critical in solving the pay gap and pay equity to help the biggest companies of the future, and that's you all, to make it possible for you to make the best decisions for yourselves, your employees, as you grow, not after. Just want to make sure everybody can hear me. So, okay. And so, you know, I don't want to waste any time. We have some pretty amazing panelists today. I can't wait to introduce them to you for us to start this conversation. First, I'd like to introduce you to Sharon Connors. Sharon is the Vice President of Diversity, Equity, Inclusion at Micron, and she is also the Board President at Fair Pay Workplace. Connors' professional experience spans human resources, information technology, project management, operation. I mean, she is in it to win it. <laughs> um, and prior to joining Micron, she also led the global diversity and inclusion efforts at Flex, which was formerly known as Flextronics. Um, she's an advocate for affordable housing and quality elder care for underrepresented groups in her hometown of Oakland, California. And she also holds a master's of science in human resources management from Golden State, Golden Gate University, I should say, and a bachelor's of arts in history from Cal State University. Welcome, Sharon. Thank you. Our next panelist, amazing, Katie Badaro. And she is the senior vice president of customer experience at Cindio. Cindio is a work place equity software company, and actually they're a technology partner of FairPay Workspace. So FairPay Workplace uses Cindio software to analyze its company pay data um, for gaps. And at uh, Cindio, as is SVP of customer experience, Katie has more than a decade of experience around compensation data, statistical knowledge and analysis, labor economics, and public speaking. In fact, she's provided pay equity analysis for a variety of different top tier businesses and financial media outlets such as the Wall Street Journal, New York Times, Bloomberg, Business Week, The Economist, CNBC, CNN Money, USA Today, Forbes, Business Insider. You get the picture. Um, she also reads these publications Sunday mornings when she's having her coffee. So she's definitely too very expert in this topic that we're going to discuss today. She's a passionate economist data nerd, mom, and she holds a BA in economics from the College of Holy Cross and a master's of science in economics from the University of Washington. So welcome both of you, great panelists, looking forward to this conversation today. Thank you. Thank you. So let's dive in everyone. Um, again, you know, we're talking about pay equity and the pay gap. They sit in a larger context in today's world where corporate social responsibility and diversity, equity, inclusion are increasingly important to organizations. Certainly the organizations that we all work for and at. So I wanna start off with you, Sharon. Could you tell us a little bit, we talk about this, but it's important for this conversation, the importance of DEI within organization, but also too, the role that pay equity plays 
within the diversity, equity, inclusion ecosystem. Yeah, thank you so much for inviting me to this conversation. I grew up in comp and benefits, and so this is very near and dear to my heart. Um, diversity, equality, and inclusion, I think, is extremely important for any business. It's really looking at how do we bring in the best and brightest talent and pull them together so that what we ultimately get is diversity of thought, because that's going to lead to the best innovation. That's going to allow you to challenge yourself, and that's going to allow you, as you're thinking about solutions, is to have very different points of view and points of reference to drive to those actual solutions. So that's how it shows up and it, it actually creates more revenue. We find that diverse organizations make decisions faster. They make better decisions. Um, so it's extremely important. It's the right thing to do, but it's also really good for business. Now, within that diversity, equality, equity, inclusion sphere, um, pay fits in there, right? Because we want to make sure not only are we bringing in the best and brightest talent and allowing them to use their voice to drive that innovation, but also that they know that they're being paid fairly for the work that, that they're done. That's going to drive higher engagement. And again, that's the right thing to do. Um, what, what we are seeing is that a lot of companies are taking a step back to really understand how are we rewarding our team members today? And it goes beyond um, just base pay. It includes stock awards or equity in the company, as well as bonuses, even opportunities to advance and grow. All of that is a part of equity. And we need to look at that to ensure everyone is able to reach their full potential. And I will tell you all from a diversity standpoint, the last thing that you want your women or your people of color worrying about or questioning is, hey, am I being paid fairly um, for the work that we've done? If you are a person of color like I am or, or a woman, I'm sure you've been there at some point in your career and you can understand how distracting and how demotivating that is. And so I think you all have a, a great opportunity to get this right from the beginning. You know, I step in and I help legacy companies that have been around for 40, 50 years to, to straighten this out. But if you're starting from inception, you have a great opportunity to create pay practices that are fair and that are equitable. And you have an opportunity to do what many companies don't do. And that's not necessarily judge someone on their prior um, pay history, but to really look at the demands of the role, what that value that role provides to the organization and to pay those folks accordingly. And by committing to pay equity and diversity, equality and inclusion, what you are doing for your business is you are developing your employer brand. And that's something that people you hire are going to go out and talk about and share with others. And that's going to allow you to attract more talent more top talent. And so that's why it's extremely important. And I'm really glad you all have joined this conversation today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sharon. I mean, I think that really captures an overall understanding for the audience. And Katie, I would love for you to talk a little bit about the smaller companies that you're working with. We have a lot of small business owners in this audience today. And can you explain what challenges, problems you're helping them solve around pay and why those challenges exist today too? Great. Thanks, Roberta. First of all, so happy to be here and be part of this conversation. And I just want to echo something that Sharon shared that's so incredibly true, is that and investing in pay equity from the start, it creates a virtuous cycle for your business. So to that end, though, is there are challenges. It's not simple. Um, if it was simple, pay equity would already be solved in the world, but it's not. So when we are here at Cindy are helping and working with organizations, a large part of our work is to help transition them from this mindset of finding and fixing a problem to being able to be proactive and plan to solve their problem. Now, when the challenges uh, come up for small organizations specifically, they often fall into one of two buckets. One, lack of resources. Oftentimes there are not the available internal resources to really put a vested strategy or focus on pay equity or even compensation strategy in general. The second challenge is lack of data or structure to define what are your roles, what are your jobs, how are you paying for those jobs and valuing them in the marketplace. Now, one of the things that we strive to do through our partnership is to help set forth a structure because you really need to have the structure to invest in pay equity from the beginning. Examples could be, you know, what are skills, roles, or characteristics that you value in your employees for them to be productive and effective? 
Your answers to these questions can help you to define your job structure. Another could be, how do you measure proficiency and ability in these skills, roles, or characteristics? And therefore, how do you value them? That can be used to define your compensation strategy. Another example could be, well, when is a characteristic required for success at your role versus when is it a nice to have? That can help you define your recruiting strategy. So once you have this kind of this clear, transparent strategy to define the work that's being done and how you want to pay for that work, that's when you can start to fold in workplace equity or more specifically pay equity. You can start simplistically by looking at certain measures such as how does pay compare across employees within similar roles. You can start to understand representation within your organization. What does your recruitment pipeline look like? Who's getting opportunities for special projects, for mentorship, for sponsorship? and how to offers uh, compare for new hires in different protected classes. Now, in general, we do find that one benefit, just to echo again what Sharon said, of being a small organization is you can decide now what your workplace objecti equity objectives are, and then how to use those objectives to define your recruitment, your pay, and your promotional processes. That's the, the definition of being proactive in addressing workplace equity, which is our vision for all companies, big and small. Thank you, Katie. Um, specifically talking to our audience here as a small or, uh, business owners. And I want to go even further and narrow the topic around some of the BIPOC entrepreneurs that we have joining us today. Um, you know, many are in early stages of tra trajectories of their companies. So you talked a little bit about you know, how you would think about the relationships between a company's core value and pay philosophy. But, you know, there's a lot of terms, um, pay equity, pay transparency, a lot of terms that we hear. Um, so, Kitty, could you kind of continue that conversation and help define some of these terms? And then Sharon will we'll get into maybe some additional conversation around that, too. Yeah, happy to. Uh, so the, the video at the top of the panel shared definitions of pay gap and pay equity, but I think it's important to just revisit them quickly for this question. So the, the pay gap is the oft quoted 82 cents on the dollar statistic that you frequently see in media. That's measuring the average pay for all working women compared to all working men. This gap increases for women of color to be 75 cents on the dollar. Now, we tend to refer to this as truly an opportunity gap because what it's really displaying is that women, and especially women of color, are underrepresented in today's top paying positions, whether that be leadership roles, so with the glass ceiling, for example, or whether that be high market value jobs. In comparison, pay equity is comparing the pay for men and women or people of different races who are doing substantially similar work to determine if they are paid equitably, or in other words, equal pay for equal work. So what helps when it comes to setting pay equity from the start? Well, we mentioned earlier a clear and objective pay philosophy that outlines what you value and how you value it is key. And you know better than anyone what would lead your business and your employees to success and how to ensure that you're mapping these measures of success to your compensation and pay philosophy. Another piece to mention is that uh, in this case, formulaic can help you make pay decisions. So the more formulaic you can make your pay philosophy based on objective measures, the less likely you are to have pay equity issues because the less likely you're making subjective decision based on perceived value versus measurable value. This is especially true in a startup where things are moving fast and furious, and it's difficult to truly predict what your startup will look like three months down the road, six months down the road, years down the road. So removing discretion as much as possible when it comes to compensation decisions to ensure you're not creating problems that you'll need to address down the road. By having this clear pay philosophy, you can share with your prospects and your employees, aka pay transparency, one of the other terms, um, what you are paying for and why you're paying for it. So it takes a guessing game out of the equation and it leads to more productive conversations and more satisfied employees. I want to give you just a really explicit example about how this can play out in a pay philosophy. Let's say that you value tenure. In other words, as your employees stay with you, they learn more about your business and are more productive workers. This could then mean that part of your pay philosophy may be to start employees at an entry pay rate, but then once they've been there for six months or a year, they get a pay increase to recognize that they developed expertise with your products or your offerings, and you want to account for that. 
Now, the important piece is to set forth a pay philosophy that provides measurable and direct characteristics like the tenure example I just shared. Be clear, communicate it, and then stick to it. Thank you. Um, Sharon, we talked about the definitions. We talked about what this means. But for small business owners at this stage, it's important for them to, too, to understand the trends and even some laws that are coming out. Could you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so it's really interesting um, what we're seeing externally, and I think it's it's very important for all business owners to to absolutely be focused on the business, but be aware of what's going on um, outside of the business. And so, what we're seeing from a legislative um, perspective is that some states are starting to require pay transparency. So, for example, in California, um, corporations are now required um, to share pay, pay ranges with candidates. So you may have someone say, hey, can you tell me the range for this job? And, and once you share that, um, they're certainly going to be interested in, in pay equity and where they fall within that range. Uh, Colorado just implemented a, a law as well where you have to list on the job description the pay ranges. And so we believe that many companies um, will follow that trend. In addition to this, what we're also seeing is on some external sites, so Glassdoor and Blind. Blind is a great uh, resource um, to, to understand what employees are saying about their employer. What we're seeing on Blind is that as soon as team members receive um, a bonus or a pay increase or a equity grant, they are going on Blind and publicly disclosing what they received and comparing it and voting on it and asking about other opportunities and how they compare. And so we think this trend of transparency will continue. And so what I'm advising um, everyone to do is get ahead of it. You know, like, let's preempt this. Think about um, how you can lead in this space and be as transparent as possible. Um, I heard someone else say a, a while ago that they have a strategy of slowly turning the lights on. And I think that's a great way to look at it, right? You start to share uh, some of your ranges and then you start to share the base pay increases. And so you're moving towards that transparency. But I do believe we will see more of that and it will really be um, led by employees. There's a certain amount of accountability now that employees are demanding of employers that we just haven't seen in the past, right? And that extends to social justice and um, social impact, sustainability, but also to pay, right? And, and to rewards. And so um, I encourage you all, if you haven't checked out Glassdoor and, and Blind, to take a look about what folks are saying around pay. It's really interesting. Thanks, Sharon. Um, I think that we're going to keep the conversation around what we can do for founders and get even more, just for lack of a better term, real about what their situation is, particularly small businesses. I mean, sometimes they're just scrambling to make payroll, right? You want to try to get to the next month, get to the next quarter. So for many, while this information is extremely helpful for many right now, they might think, well, you know, this is a dream for me to think about this early on. But Sharon, can you talk about what advice you would give to founders around pay principles as they face those real challenges today? Yeah, I would say um, it's so interesting when we were watching the video and it talked about how founders, women and, and women of color pay themselves less. Right. So um, it's kind of like when you're in the airplane and they say you have to put your oxygen mask on first in order to help others. While there are constraints, you certainly want to be considering yourself within that picture. Right. And not neglect what you need um, to to make sure that you're able um, from a financial wellness perspective to do what you need to do while supporting the business. So I think um, it's a mind shift change. You know, some folks may think that that's selfish, but I think that's self-preservation and it only makes you better for the business. So I would say, number one, include yourself as you're thinking about um, all of the um, obligations and responsibilities you have, put yourself on that list. Secondly, I would say educate yourself. You know, do you know what a, a founder um, in, in, in your field, in your area with your expertise 
should be receiving from a, a compensation standpoint. So talk to others, build out that network. I find a lot of information um, from my network. It's always good to have total rewards folks in your network, but ask around, find the right people, do some benchmarking. It's very powerful and it, it will help you at least know if you're not there today, what you're aiming for in the future, right? And you'll, you'll get a clear sense of where you are. And I would say the same for the people that you're employing, you know, what is the market demanding? I would get really clear on your employee value proposition. So there's many different strategies with compensation. Some people want to lead with comp. Other companies or businesses lag with comp because they offer other things. They offer flexibility. They offer um, growth opportunities. They offer extraordinary experiences. Or um, maybe there's, there's access to... Um, uh, company resources, right? I, I know someone who took a job with a, a football team. It wasn't the highest paying job, but there were access to the players. That was important to them, you know? So <laughs> think about what what is your employee value proposition? What is it that's differentiating you from other companies? And maybe it's pay, and then that's great. You set your pay strategy, but maybe it isn't. And so you're messaging that. I think that's important for your team members to understand, hey, we may not lead on pay, but what I'm giving is a share of the business, or I'm giving you a unique opportunity to learn something, or I'm giving you exposure to people that you would necessarily meet, right? That could be your husband in my friend's case. Um, so, you know, think about that and get really clear on that messaging. And again, do your benchmarking so you can understand where the market is and where it makes sense for you to be. That would be my advice. And then lastly, uh, my father shared this with me. I grew up hearing this, um, know your worth and add tax. So think about what you're worth and then make sure that you are accounting for everything that you are bringing for the table. And I know this is, I'm a comp person and it's hard for me to negotiate, right? My husband's always like, go higher, go higher. I'm like, oh, I don't know. Um, but brush up on your negotiation skills too. You know, read some books, watch some videos. Masterclass has a great video um, on negotiating, but get comfortable with being uncomfortable. Pay, pay is a very uncomfortable topic but it's something we need to start talking about. So I encourage you to not run from those conversations. You know, I one strategy I've seen people use as I've been managing comp is they'll put things in an email before the conversation, right? So if they get nervous about bringing it up, they've already sort of put it out there ahead of time and it holds you accountable for touching on all of those different areas. So that, that would be my advice. Thank you. And I think you kind of, um talked a little bit too in terms of the context of where we are today just if we're looking at the world today right the great resignation you talked yes. about you know a lot of people are making the decision after COVID to do something different or just not go back to work or give themselves a break for whatever reason um and then there are people who are not working and then there's conversation about how there's so many roles to fill just what we're we're thinking about that and we're thinking about smaller companies um you know katie from a narrow perspective kind of what would you recommend entrepreneurs do to address compensation at this time to entice candidates to their company you know and also to you know if they're thinking about how to make their payroll etc how do you fold those things and could you talk a little bit about that too to our audience because these are real challenges that they're meeting at the same time yeah absolutely i i do want to recognize that i learn something every time i hear sharon talk and i just love so much that statement of know your worth plus tax i mean that's a great takeaway for everybody in the audience <laughs> Um, and, and I think when it comes to kind of setting your compensation strategy during this time of the great resignation, I want to also echo a little bit something Sean was, was talking about, because I think it applies here too, which is the fact that to, to have a successful business, you need to be a successful founder. To be a successful founder, you need to remove any of the stress that comes along with what do you need to be paid in order to have a growth mindset and focus on your business? So that's really important. And I and I love what Aaron shared in the comments because it's it's true. It's not a level playing field for founders out there. So keeping in mind what your personal situation is in addition to what the market is telling you is fair compensation are two important data points. 
That being said, I, um, when you're thinking about attracting and bringing uh, employees to your workforce, I think it's important to keep in mind that the that sometimes founders or small business owners fall into the trap that they will do whatever it takes or whatever they feel it takes to get talented people in the door. Uh, however, that is a problem um, when it comes to pay equity, and it's oftentimes leads to problems down the line or decisions that you'll be making now and then paying for later. Uh, one of the thought leaders in this space who I encourage you to look up, and I will put her name in the comments, her name is Molly Graham, and she was one of the early employees at Facebook. So she started there when it was about 400 employees, which was early in Facebook uh, world, and she helped them define their compensation philosophy. And one of the things that she shared from her experience is that most startups overpay for talent because they undervalue their own equity, which means if you're undervaluing it, your candidates and your employees will also undervalue it. So it's important to note that what drives employees to join a startup is oftentimes not cash compensation. They join for future potential, which is truly captured in that value or that perception of the equity. But most people really don't understand how to value equity, even if you're the smartest person in the room. So one of the things to keep in mind is have a simple guide on understanding the equity that you can include with your offer letters when you're making offers to candidates. And then one other point I want to make too, especially at small organizations, is that employees often talk about compensation. It's not as secret as people tend to think it is. It's not as taboo to talk about it as it has been in the past. And this is just more and more prevalent that employees are having very candid conversations with each other or with their employer. So you really want to make sure you're putting in the work to have a clear, equitable compensation plan now. So you're setting your future self up for success with a happy and retained workforce. Uh, you know, when you're worried about getting your company off the ground or potentially making payroll or dealing with the great resignation, the last thing you want to worry about is an employee revolt due to unfair um, pay practices, real or perceived, which can be created if you have this lack of transparency. Absolutely. I mean, I think that particularly when you talked about um, equity, I, I'm kind of going off a little bit, but could you talk a little bit, both of you, more about how you have that conversation if you are someone who is working in a startup or even someone who's a startup owner in terms of crafting that for the co for the compensation to be real so people really understand what that value is because we talk about it in a very esoteric sense but not in a sense that's really concrete i would love to hear what both of you have to say um, about that. Sharon, I'll, I'll start with you first. Yeah, thank you for asking that. I I read a great article in the Wall Street Journal. It came out th in this Saturday, Sunday issue. It's called The Real Meaning of Freedom, Freedom at Work. I actually have it here. And I heard you all to read that because what it talked about was we are at a pivotal moment with the great resignation. And really what folks are doing is they're marching towards a new freedom where they determine who they work with and how they work and why they are working. And I think if you just anchor on that as a company, when someone is joining and your total rewards to me is a piece of that, right? So here, here is our purpose as a company. Here's our vision. Here's our mission. Here's how we're going to have a impact, a, a social impact, if you will. And here is your role in that. And then here's how you will be compensated, right? I think if you can make those connections, people want to understand purpose, right? Where do I fit in your company? And how is what I'm doing driving to the big picture? And then if you can articulate the value of that from a compensation perspective, I think that really connects the dots. And, and from everything that I'm seeing and I'm reading about the great resignation, that's really going to put you in a position to win the war on talent. Absolutely. Katie. Yeah. You know, I think it's important to note that um, people just want to understand. They want to understand mm -hmm. and feel comfortable in what they're understanding. So the, the more you can do to, to bring understanding to your prospects, to your employees about the decisions you're making and why, more importantly, why are you making those decisions? You know, the more success you'll have in keeping them happy, satisfied and staying with 
Um, the other piece I wanted to touch on too, something Sharon shared at the very beginning was around uh, your employer brand. So this is a lever in addition to equity that um, smaller organizations have and, and sometimes underutilize or undervalue what their employer brand can do for them when it comes to um, keeping employees or attracting employees. So when for gender and racial pay equity, it's important to know it's always been a part of employer branding, but very recently the um, Edelman Trust Barometer, which measures why employees trust employers and what's driving that trust, they found that gender and racial pay equity was at least twice as important as increasing share price or profits. Mm -hmm. And, and so why does this matter? Well, trust is really important to an organization because it creates an environment for innovation, uh, it creates psychological safety, and also productivity. So if you're a small business owner or a founder just starting out and you know your people are your most important and precious asset, you want to ensure you create this environment that engages them and builds that trust. So thinking about uh, pay transparency as it pertains to, you know, what does equity mean as your total compensation package? How are we committing to pay equity as an organization? How are we committing to broader workplace equity as an organization? And then framing that story and communicating it out is really what will allow you to fight some of these macroeconomic challenges such the great resignation and you know i'll just leave you with this one last point which is it doesn't have to be a very in-depth detailed story right a short story can go a long way the mm -hmm. the key is the story has to be clear and it has to represent your values and your culture as an organization absolutely and i think too um just in talking about that the importance of trust you both talked about that trust in relationship to transparency and when employees and anyone that is working towards a goal particularly entrepreneurs when that trust is there people are just by virtue of it existing more productive you relax, you're more comfortable, you want to work because you're trusting your leaders, you're trusting the vision, you're trusting the mission. And that's why, too, that's more important. And ultimately, that leads to more revenue. So, I mean, at the end of the day, um, you know, it, it does still come to the bottom line, really engaging and implementing that culture of trust within the organization, specifically around compensation. Um, so I, I do want to talk a little bit just about, especially for women and women of color, could you all give them some practical advice around negotiating your work? I'm going to start with you, um, Ad Tax, and <laughs> you, could, you could give some mechanics to people as they're thinking about that and, and negotiating their work. Yeah, so I would say, number one, do your homework. We talked about this, um, or I mentioned this earlier, but make sure you understand um, what your worth is on the market, right? And and I think you can do that through talking to people, through research, but I would say make sure you understand. Number two, I would say practice. So before I um, negotiate any offer, I practice with my husband and, and he's tough, right? And so he'll... he'll um, help me to fine tune my points. He'll tell me to go higher. I think the other thing is to educate yourself on all the different levers of comp. So I think this is something I didn't understand early in my career. I was negotiating on base pay, but there were many other things that I should be negotiating on. Um, uh, time off, you know, 401k allocation, deferred comp, equity. I want to understand spot bonuses. And, and then, you know, I often ask, is there anything else I'm not thinking about that I should be asking for? Um, guaranteed severance, right? So if you really don't understand pay, it's really hard to negotiate. Um, and, and then I would say some great advice that I heard a while back is to go high. So I think if you throw out a number first that is really high, folks have to negotiate down versus if they throw out a number that's really low, then you're trying to negotiate up from there. So I would say be bold, you know, throw throw out a big number. Nine times out of 10, they're not gonna take the deal off the, ta the table, your top talent, right? Um, but what they are going to try to do is come to a place where they can meet some of your expectations. And so don't be afraid um, to, to be bold about your compensation, right? Shoot, shoot for the moon is, is my advice. Um, and then I would say, lastly, um, 
brush up on your negotiation skills. And, and a lot of times what I've seen is when folks ask for certain comp packages and the, the other party comes back, there's still room to negotiate on the table, right? So that first offer doesn't have to be the final offer. So don't be afraid to push a little bit. And I know that that's not always in our in our nature, but um, get get comfortable with that. That would be my advice. Thank you, thank you, Sharon. That was, I mean, you always have so many gems. Uh, <laughs> so, so so many, um, Katie. From your perspective, particularly since you're always looking at the data and mm -hmm. navigating this, what are some of the advice that you would give women, women of color, negotiating the mechanics? Some some things that you can share with the audience today. Yeah, absolutely. Van, I just hate going after Sharon because she offers so much valuable insight. So I'll do my best. Um, I, I would say that um, I, I am a data geek. Uh, I'll, hopefully you all can be too, because that's really what will lead you to success. Truly understanding what is your worth in the marketplace. Sharon earlier mentioned Glassdoor. They're a great resource for reviews. Also a great resource for compensation data. Salary.com is another one. Um, for the founders out there who are trying, trying to understand their own compensation, usually your funders or your VC firm will have data that they can share with you too. So don't be shy to ask for data or do your research. Uh, I totally agree with Sharon that practice is really, really important. The only um, addition that I would make to that is practice with multiple people of all different types and backgrounds. Um, the mm -hmm. reason being we all have our perceived perception of how we effectively can or should communicate. And that is different depending on other, various people's backgrounds. And you want to make sure you're prepared for that conversation regardless of who's on the other side of the table. The other piece I would mention is... Uh, just honing in a little bit and adding again to Sharon's already excellent advice, which is oftentimes when offers are made, they're expecting you to negotiate. Very rarely are offers made at kind of their ceiling of what they're willing to give you. You know, they, your top talent, they want you. They wouldn't have made an offer if they didn't, but it's all a negotiation. So they're, they're bringing it at a place that's lower than they're expecting you to come back at them with. So if you don't neg negotiate, you're probably leaving money on the table. So don't be afraid to negotiate. And then the last piece that I would that I would share is that there's a lot of um, mindset change that needs to happen. So uh, women and um, people of color are research shows that they have a mindset that negotiation is adversarial, or that you're fighting for something the employer doesn't want to give you, and that's generally not true. But it's hard to get out of that mindset. So the more you can root your conversation in data and examples with a goal of learning, the more likely you'll be led to success. Maybe you won't get the additional money in that initial negotiation, but if you approach it from a, from a perception of learning, hopefully you can figure out how you then get there. How do you need to show up in the role to get that, that increase as you expand within your responsibility? Can I add one more thing? All Absolutely. Great points, Katie, but something I, th I thought about that I really um, in the past was uncomfortable with, and I'm just now getting comfortable. Mm -hmm. And that is my walk away number. So there have been um, some amazing opportunities at like some companies that I would love to work at, right? But they just weren't able to meet what I felt my worth is, right? And so I had to get comfortable with passing on those opportunities because it wasn't where I felt I did not feel that it was a, a equitable relationship right I felt like I would be giving what I would be giving would be too much based on what I would be getting from a compensation perspective so I would also say you know believe in yourself Believe that you have what it takes and that your skill set or, or whatever it is that you're bringing to the table is in demand and it's valuable and there's a price to that. And be okay with missing some opportunities because what you're doing is you are setting a precedence for um, how you will be compensated and how you will be valued. And so just get, just get a little comfortable with that. That would be my last piece of advice. I think that is an excellent piece of advice. I even had a story about that. A friend of mine who's an entrepreneur, she's working with um, kind of a, a early series startup. They asked her to be sort of an expert. And they also asked, well, you know, maybe she would want to invest. And what she said without hesitation, and I'll never forget this. She said, you know, I thought about the money. And then I said, okay, they asked me to be this expert. Do I want to invest this money? 
hmm, they're basically just asking me to bet on myself. And I do that. So yes, without any hesitation. And that stuck with me so much, not just mm -hmm. words, but the immediacy and the fact that she didn't hesitate to think in her own mind. I'm betting on myself, of course, I'm going to win. So I think that that's really important in terms of negotiation. Um, we are coming close to the end of time here. Um, so I do want to ask both of you, what's one piece of advice that you would leave the entrepreneurs with today? Um, one resource that, you know, from this discussion or learning, we'll be passing some on to, to the audience, but what would you leave them with? Katie, I'll go with you first. <laughs> Okay, um, I, I think that the the core piece is we've we've provided a lot of aspirational direction of strategy and what you can do, but the core piece is to start with where are you right now, uh, and if you have work to do as a small company, especially with limited data and limited resources, kind of how can you take a simplistic approach to start? So, borrowing from Sharon again, just maybe turning on some of the lights in the house, but not everything. Um, and, and those are just core metrics that you should be capturing and thinking about within your business. You know, how many women are in leadership roles? How does the average pay for women of color compared to white men? And so on, you know, really determine the story you want to tell and how you get that story out to the market and then how you inform that story. One suggestion would be to review companies um, that are committed to pay equity in a way that you admire, see what they're doing, research to understand what they're doing and how they're communicating about it to kind of build your communication strategy. And then the other piece, I think, is to get it right from the beginning, you really need to put guidelines in place as much as possible. Define what you value in your employees, how you compensate for these characteristics, and how you ensure this pay philosophy is persistent regardless of a person's gender, race, ethnicity, or other protected class. Now, I did want to touch a little bit on what Erin um, put into the comments, which is how do you balance out having a formulaic or measured approach to compensation and the idea of negotiation? They seem like they could be in contradiction to each other. Absolutely true. I think that's so true, Erin, and a really astute point, which is the idea that if you don't have a formulaic approach to negotiation in and of itself, you can also run the risk that more, let's say, loud voices in those conversations or pushy voices in those conversations can get compensation that moves you more into the area of subjectivity and away from the very clear formulaic approach you've built for compensation. Um, Molly Graham, again, I saw someone share her, her podcast, something that she recommends is actually startups shouldn't allow for negotiation. An offer is an offer um, to avoid that risk that can be created in those conversations. Um, the, the head of uh, Reddit was famous for making this choice, that there was just specific offers. You could have an equity high offer or a cash high offer, and that was what your decision point would be. You couldn't negotiate that offer. If you do, one piece of advice, and I'm curious what Sharon thinks about this point too, one piece of advice I would have and something we've seen some organizations do is if they're entertaining candidates and someone negotiates who belongs to one protected class and someone who belongs to another didn't negotiate, you should then have the conversation with them to negotiate. You should um, instrument the conversation to start versus them pushing the conversation to start. But I'll leave you with that. So the, come up with your guidelines, think about your story, and get the process going now simplistically and build in complexity as you grow. Great pieces of advice. Um, hard to follow that. I would say I'm um, just on the compensation question around um, negotiating and formulas. To me, it all depends on what are you measuring in that formula? So if you're measuring years of experience, but I started my job in a nonprofit or I volunteered or I took time off to have a child, I think there could be some bias in that. So I, I think um, it's not a bad idea, but you need to make sure that what you are measuring is has some equality in that process. Um, or equity if needed. I would say for my piece of advice, I am so in awe of what all of you all are doing. It is so different from my world. I, I cannot imagine you all have a lot on your plate, a lot to think about. You've got businesses to run. And so I would say, don't take this on alone. Do not. There are people that will help you. There are companies that have um, guidelines around compensation that they would happily share with you. There are CEOs you could reach out to that would love to walk you through this process. So I would say don't feel like you're in this by yourself and don't take it all on alone. Build out your network. Talk to your peers. Get a small circle together that you, know, you all bounce ideas back and forth on compensation and policy and pay transparency 
transparency and you've got someone you can call to understand what are the laws coming up. I don't want you all out there re researching those. So I would say tap into those that that um, will help you and put me on that list. You can always shoot me a LinkedIn message, but there are so many people I'm sure already in your network who are ready to help you in this journey. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you both. Thank you everyone for attending today. This does conclude our session. Um, and there are many more ways that you can continue this conversation. We also did drop some resources into the chat for people who are still on uh, the, the session right now, just so that you can utilize them. And I also do want to encourage you all to visit the NASDAQ Entrepreneurial Center. Um, that is the center.nasdaq.org. You can sign up for the newsletter and also too, there's free classes and free mentorship opportunities for entrepreneurs of all sizes around the world. So thank you, Sharon and Katie, you. for your insights, your expertise. You all are amazing. Um, and behalf of the NASDAQ Entrepreneurial Center and Fair Pay Workspace, um, we thank you for joining us today. So everyone have a good rest of your day. Take right. care. Thank you, everybody.